All right, thank you. Um, so it's, I, I feel great, uh, very grateful to be able to be here today and very humble. Some of the, the other speakers are doing some really interesting things, had some really great stuff to share, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and be a part of it. Um, what I do is I work with organizations, I work with companies around bringing, uh, finding a sense of meaning in life. Now, the funny thing about it is they don't know that that's what we're doing when we start out. Usually, they think we're talking about something along the lines of, of employee engagement or leadership development or building effective teams or something along those lines. But it always ends up coming back to questions of meaning. And keep in mind, these are, are serious organizations. And it's, they're not touchy-feely groups or whatever else. It's the US Army. I've worked with foreign governments, with global law firms, uh, things along those lines. So it's, but the fact that they're doing serious work and, and are serious about what they do, that doesn't mean that it has to be devoid of joy and that we have to lose a sense of that we're loving what we're doing. And so that's what we come up and we'll come in and work on. Uh, where does this stuff come from? So you'll see up on the screen, um, back in 2000, psychology has always been a disease state model. My training's in positive psychology. Uh, psychology has always been a disease state model. So let's find what doesn't work and fix it. And so if you look to the, to the right of the screen, in 2000, researchers went and did a word search on the abstracts of different psychological journals. So at the beginning of each research paper, there's a summary in the beginning. They did a word search there around things like anger, anxiety, depression. And so you see on the screen the number of articles that came up, 54,000 articles in that time period on depression. And the good thing about that is we know what depression looks like. We know what works in terms of treatment. And so all of that's really, really good. But the question, if you look at the, the, the other side of the screen, when they did the same type of, of word search around joy, happiness, life satisfaction, found that psychology had been neglecting that or almost neglecting it. Um, and the question of meaning comes in because most of us are not living over on this side of the screen. Most of us are doing OK. And so when I go in talking with organizations, that's what people say is, yeah, things are pretty good, but I feel like, isn't there something more? That if I'm going to be spending more time in the office, behind a desk, wearing a suit, than I do with my wife and with my kids, what can I do to get some, some more meaning out of it, to make that time worthwhile? And so that's what we try to do. Um, some of the earlier speakers today talked about different measures of well-being and, and um, uh, signs that, that things are going pretty good. And so I've got up on the screen uh, the gross domestic product or gross national product from 1947 until 1998, going up. Let's draw some more lines on there. Life expectancy has gone up. Literacy rates have gone up. Access to health care has gone up. The quality of health care has gone up. All these measures have been rising over that period. Life satisfaction has stayed flat. It's relatively unaffected by all these good things that are going on. Now, there's different ways to measure, to, to read that and, and what that means. There's something else that's been going up as well depression. So even with all these other good things in society going on, we're not any happier. And in fact, depression rates are rising. So what positive psychology does is it looks at when people are at their best, when we're our happiest, when we're finding a sense of meaning, when we're finding a sense of joy, and saying, why is that? How can we create more of it? What are the consequences of it? And how can we bring that into what we do on a daily basis? whether it's work, successful marriages, or home lives, what's going on there and what can we do? <clears throat> now, if, I if you left today with the impression that positive psychology is all about puppy dogs and happiness, then I left you with the wrong impression. Happiness is definitely a part of it, but a lot of times we're at our best when, things, when difficult things are happening, when we have to struggle through hardship, when there are difficult uh, challenges that we have. Um, in fact, what we know uh, when you look at the research and when you look at what's actually happening out there is that when, when tragedy happens or when difficult things happen, there's going to be a certain percentage of the population who's going to feel a sense of uh, depression or they'll feel immobilized 
or otherwise get, get frozen by the activity. And we hear a lot about that. We hear about post-traumatic stress, things along those lines. What we don't hear about as often, but it is just as uh, frequent in occurring, is that there's a certain percentage of the population that when things go wrong, when difficulties come up, that they actually grow through it. They thrive in it. And it's, a, it's something called post-traumatic growth. And in fact, one thing that's going on now with the U.S. Army, where uh, suicide rates are the highest they've ever been, post-traumatic stress is the highest it's ever been, uh, they're in the process of developing emotional resilience of all 1.1 million soldiers and their families. Because what we've found through this work is that while part of this is biological, I mean, that people are going to be inclined towards a different response to stress, uh, some of it is skills-based. Whoops. Uh, the, the slide actually, it, it shifts. We've got the ability to shift that curve so that more people end up thriving in the end and that fewer end up having crises as a result. So how do we get there? So I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is it's easy. The bad news is it's hard. It's both hard and it's easy. It's hard because it involves creating new habits. Uh, it involves um, uh, having uh, sustained action over time. Uh, it, it involves having people to support you and encourage you with everything that's going on. But it's easy because what we're asking, uh, what I'm asking you to do is something that you've done before. I'm just asking you to do more of it. What I'm asking of you is to find those moments in which you are who you are when you're at your best and then do it more often. So let me say it again, to find those times when you are who you actually are, we're not making stuff up here, and let's just do it again and again. So all of us have times, you can think back to when things were going really, really well, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's at home, wherever else, that things are going, that you're bringing to that experience what's the best and most natural about you coming from your strengths of character. So whether that's your passion or compassion, uh, humor, interest, affection, appreciation of beauty and excellence, to find those moments. And then we go in and we talk about, okay, how do we bring that into the workplace? All of us have things that we don't want to do, whether it's at work or other places. But if we can start from that point, bringing what's best about you and bring that to restructure how you approach your work. You're going to have a greater sense of meaning. You're going to have a greater sense of connection. And ultimately, um, you're going to, your life satisfaction is going to improve as well. So that's the first part. Use those moments. The second part of it is use those moments to connect to other people, uh, to take what's most the truest and most natural in you and use that as an opportunity to build those relationships. Because ultimately, that's where meaning ends up coming from is in our connections with other people. So all of this research came together for me around a couple different stories. Um, in 2006, watching the Soccer World Cup, Brazil was one of the, the favorites. They're, they're usually one of the favorites. They'd won two of the three previous World Cups. They came in second in the other, uh, in, the, in the third one. And if, if you don't follow soccer, Brazil has a creative, dynamic, energetic, attacking style. It's a very beautiful style of soccer. So much so that the audience, uh, the, the Brazilian fans, call it Jogo Bonito, the beautiful game. But in 2006, something else happened. Uh, Brazil abandoned the beautiful game, and they, they approached it with a much more uh, conservative, defensive style, which can be quite effective. Teams have won the World Cup with a very defensive style of play. But what struck me at that time is watching on the news and talking to friends of mine who were saying, yeah, they're winning, but where's the beautiful game? And I'm looking at this thinking, well, the objective of it's to win. You're doing just fine. What, what's there to, to complain about with that? So that was the first thing that got me thinking around this stuff. Um, the second thing that then pieced it all together for me was um, I've never liked playing board games. For me, they're stressful. I, I, I get anxious. And uh, so what does my wife do knowing this? She signs us up for a couple's game night. 
you know, so we go once a month with other couples and play, uh, play board games. So like a good spouse pushing me outside my comfort zone and all that. And I'm thinking, why are we doing this? And so one, one night we're out with some other families. We're playing some game. I don't remember what it was. And Jenny's not really paying attention to the rules. She's not really paying attention to what's going on the board. And she makes some egregious error in the game. And so I feel the tension start to rise. But then she did something that brought all this together for me. She laughed. And she laughed. And she laughed. And the laughter became contagious. And everyone else in the room began to laugh also. And that's what then connected to me this idea of the beautiful game. It didn't matter what was going on on the board. It didn't matter what the, the end result was. But what she was doing is she was bringing what was best about her to the way she played. So bringing all the humor, affection, interest, passion and compassion, the best things about us. The beautiful game is not about soccer. It's not about board games. It's about life in general, whether that's your, in your working life, whether it's, it's back home with your families. Think back, find those times when you are the best that you are. You know, if you can't find them, go talk to your spouse, talk to your best friend, talk to your mom. They'll be able to come and point to all sorts of times uh, that you were at your best. Then take those things and find additional ways to bring them as you play the game, whether it's at work, whether it's home, with your families. Then you'll have uh, a sense of the beautiful game and you'll find greater meaning and engagement and everything that you're doing. Thank you. All right. Happiness, schmappiness. Everybody just needs an 